Give it up for Pastor Al Valdez. Amen. It's so good to be in the house tonight. I'm super excited and so honored, Pastor Al, that you and Sister Georgina would entrust me with this podium and this mic. I know so many great men of God have spoken from this podium, and so it's, it's an incredible honor for me to be here tonight. My wife is with me tonight, my beautiful wife of 24 years. Amen. We've been married 24 years. And, man, I'm, I love her more every, every day. Amen. She's, she's such an amazing uh, person. And my friend Javier is also here with me tonight. Pastor Javier is here. So thank you, Javier, for coming out. Such an honor, such a privilege to be here. Um, I have a lot of great friends in the VO family. And, you know, one of the first churches that I walked into as a kid back in the 19, uh, early 70s was the Victory Outreach Church. And uh, some of my family were a part of Victory Outreach Church very early in the 70s for those old school people that are in the house today. And so, like, I, I've been around the VO family my whole life. And so uh, when I met Pastor Al, I just felt like, you know, he was part of my family. And so I, I'm just privileged and blessed to be here. And you guys have done a phenomenal job. Give it up for the worship team. What an incredible presence and glory. There's a beautiful, beautiful spirit in, w in this house and what God is building. And my friends, your future is just beginning. And so we, we thank, uh, thank you all for, for this opportunity. You may all be seated. Y'all may all be seated. Thank you so much. Um, received greetings from my pastor, Pastor Billy Preston. I've been at uh, Bethel Church, a.k.a. Iglesia Betel, which is a Spanish church down the street from here. Um, my family came here in the 70s. I recently asked my father um, when... When, when we came to the United States, my family's originally from Guanajuato, and my dad said, uh, when I said, Dad, when did, we, when did we come to the U.S.? He said, August 25th, 1973. I was like, whoa, like this guy knows the, the day. What time, Dad? You know? <laughs> and so he was like right on point. So I was about eight months years old, uh, eight months old, and so we moved to, to National City from Mexico, and uh, pretty much grew up in, in National City. Uh, then my family moved over to Paradise Hills. And then that's when the trouble came, right? But, <laughs> but, but yeah, so I, you know, I, I've been at church since I was seven years old. Um, I remember being in a Sunday school class and teachers talking about the story of Moses and how he delivered uh, the Jewish from Egypt. And at the end, she's talking about Jesus and how he came to save us. And she's like, who would like to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I had never heard this message in my life. I didn't know what she was talking about. All the kids in the Sunday school class saying, me, 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 raising their hands. And I'm looking around. I'm the only kid in that Sunday school classroom who didn't raise his hand. And when I, when I realized that I was the only person in there that didn't raise their hand, I kind of went like this. And I just went like that. I don't know what they're talking about, but I want to be a part of that. And since seven years old to till this day, uh, <laughs> I've been a part of... Check this out. I've been a part of one church my whole life. I've been at Bethel since I was seven years old. So, um, so you could just, just think about that, right? And so I'm still there. I love my church. I love my pastors. And uh, I just learned so much from them. And so, yeah, so I'm here today uh, really just to really share with you what God has put in my heart. As Pastor Al said, I've spent the last four seasons as a chaplain for a major league team here in, in the city. And it's been a really cool experience to be able to do life with uh, baseball players. Because not only do we have an opportunity to minister to the life of the players from our home team, but we also get an opportunity to minister to the players from a life from the visiting team. And so it's super cool to kind of see um, how God works in, in this type of setting. Um, because if you know anything about baseball players, or players or professional athletes in general, there's big egos and big money involved, right? And so when you have a big ego and big money, sometimes God is your last option, right? And so uh, it's cool to see how a lot of these guys would just put, put aside their big egos and their big money and come and hear God's word and come and hear, you know, just a, a, just a good message about what Jesus has to say. And it's awesome also to see how we get a chance to also minister to umpires. So we walk into the umpire's room every Sunday when they're here at home around 12, 12 o'clock, and we get to talk to four umpires about the gospel. 
And it's crazy to see, yeah, get up for Jesus. What, a, what an incredible opportunity, right? Like, I don't know about you, like Pastor Elsa, I don't want to create no, no issues here tonight, right? I love the Dodgers. I get to be in, uh, in the same clubhouse and in the same, matter of fact, in almost like a closet-sized space with Kershaw, right? Think about that. Here's this multimillionaire, right, <laughs> who's got so much prestige in who he is, and yet he's in this closet hearing this Mexican kid talk about Jesus. Come on, somebody. Say amen. <laughs> Say amen to that. Right? And, so, and so it's super cool to, see, to be able to just minister to all these guys and, and to see um, God work, work in their lives. And then these guys go out and they play, and the game starts, right? Like today was horrible. I think it was like 12 to 4. I almost took the jersey off before I walked in here. <laughs> but you got to understand, like, you know, I, I, I grew up a Padre fan my whole life here, 1984. <laughs> like, like, hey, man, listen, <laughs> like, I bleed blue. It just ain't your blue, right? <laughs> but I said, but I just, you know, I grew up in a baseball family. My father's, you know, watching baseball his whole life. And so, like, win or lose, I'm a diehard Padre fan, right? <laughs> so, so. But I love, I love every team because every team that comes in, I have to love them and share the love of guys, Christ with them, right? And so that's the beautiful thing about what I do. So I, I want you to turn with me uh, really quickly. I brought my Bible on purpose today, right? Because bringing your Bible to church, it, it, it creates a statement. And so I wanted to do that tonight, is bring the Bible. I always bring my Bible with me wherever I go. But I want us to turn uh, in Luke chapter 15, we're going to, Look at a passage of scripture, a few passages of scripture, verse 25. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I want to just give context to what, what I feel the Lord's put in my heart, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, in Luke chapter 15, verse 25, it says this. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother is back. Your brother's back. He was told, and your father has killed a fattened calf. And we are celebrating because of his safe return. Verse 28, and the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. And his father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fat calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. Come on, somebody. Everything I have is yours. And we had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has now come back to life. And he was lost, but now he is found. Right? That's a, that's a, this is a powerful, powerful scripture. When we, when we look at this scripture... We all, in modern Christianity, we think this as the prodigal son. But in reality, if you look at the New King's James, or in this particular version, it's, it's this parable is the parable of the lost son. And so when you think about baseball, right, you think about baseball, and you go to the game. How many of you guys have recently been to a game, right? The Padres aren't always winning. They have some challenges, all right? I got to admit. They're not always winning, but you're always winning, okay? And when you get to a baseball game, and let's say the Padres and Dodgers, let's just use that for an analogy tonight because that will get the crowd excited, right? So when the Dodgers come in town and you go to the stadium, you, you think you're in L.A., right? You've ever been to a Dodger-Padre game? You think you just walked into, you know, Chavez Ravine. <laughs> There's so many Dodger fans. Even when the, the Giants come to town, you think you're in San Francisco. And there's so many people out there who are wearing the opposite attire of the home team. And you hear the crowd roaring every time someone hits a base hit, someone does something good, the crowd will always roar. 
and people will get excited and, and cheer and chat, and you've probably done it yourself, right? And if you're seated in the wrong sections, you might get some be beer spilled on you, right? <laughs> but people get excited, and this is what the whole thing is about. You're at the game. You're, you want your team to win. You want to cheer them on, and there's a crowd. Of, the crowd is like just in it when the game is good, right? You've ever been to a game, maybe it goes extra innings, and the crowd's just in it. Nobody is left. It's the 10th inning. People want to see who's going to win. Everybody has an opportunity because both teams have been playing really well, right? And you have this crowd that is chanting and hoping to win. And everyone, every, here, the, the reality is this. Even though everyone's together, they're really all divided, right? Even though they're all in the same stadium, there's divisions among them. And there's two types of crowd. Right? There's two types of crowd. There's the Dodger crowd, and then there's the Padre crowd. And that is the split between the division. Is you have two cities competing for one game, which in a lot of times in the early season, that one game could de definitely mean a lot, or maybe it means nothing. Especially if you're the Padres, it probably means nothing. <laughs> it means nothing. <laughs> And so, and so you have the crowd, and they're all into this thing. <laughs> and you see, sometimes we can, we can be on one side or the other. But in reality, how do we, how do we manage to kind of come together and, and, and look at each other and say, even though we're competitors, we have something in common. We have something in common. Even though that we're competing against each other tonight and we're divided, there's something in common that brings us together to celebrate what's going on on this field, right? And if you think about this parable, really it's this conversation that Jesus is having with two groups of people. He's got two groups of people in front of him, and he realizes that there is chaos and there's this division of and there's this division and there's this uproar because there's two sides of people that, that are in front of him. And he has to address them based on what can bring them together. On this side, he's got sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors. Come on, homies. What else? You know, the list can go on and on and on, right? And he's addressing this crowd. And on the other side, there's Pharisees, Sadducees, and religious leaders. There's all these legalistic people, for, so to speak, right? He's got two crowds, and, and Jesus looks at this situation, and he pulls himself behind, and he's about to address these crowds. He's smart. Jesus, I'm telling you, Jesus is, is, is wisdom, right? He knows exactly what each crowd needs. He knows exactly how to come at people. And that's why he speaks in these parables. If you, there's three parables here that, that I want to just really briefly kind of walk you through tonight that I believe Ju Jesus uses these illustrations to really deliver the message of how these crowds can come together. He's about to deliver this powerful message. You know, recently we had a, a kid walk in our neighborhood. I live in a cul-de-sac. And it was a Sunday night. My family w was over. We're having a barbecue. We're having fun. And this kid uh, walks into the neighborhood, and he breaks into a car. And then he breaks into another car. And he breaks into another car. And then another car. And then another car. Five cars later, he breaks into my daughter's car, car number six. And then he breaks into another car, my nephew's car, car number seven. And then he breaks into my car, <laughs> car number eight. But by the time he was broke, breaking into my car, someone saw him. And one of my uh, nephews comes running in the house and he goes, Theo, Theo, someone's in your car. And I thought there was people at my house. I'm like, okay, I'm just maybe someone from the street. No, I don't know who that is. <sighs> I got up. Like, what do you mean you don't know who that is? I walked outside of my house. Lo and behold, there is someone in my car. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> the BC version of Carlos Nicasio is just 
You're about to come out here. <laughs> so I was like, hey, man, get out of my car. What are you doing? So I pulled the guy out of my car. He's a big old kid. You know, he's a young kid. I could tell he's probably like 18 or 19. So I grab him by the hands, and I put him up against uh, the car, and I put his hands, and I'm like, open your legs, man. Come on. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I had this kid on my car like this, and I'm going through his pockets, and I'm pulling out. Oh, like, this is my flashlight, dude. What are you doing? Like, he start, I start pulling stuff that belonged to me out of his pockets, throwing it on the floor. And I had him spread eagle. And then I took his arm and I put it behind him. And I put this arm, right, put, put that arm behind him. And, um, and then I, I kind of told him, all right, come on, follow me. And I was walking with his two arms. He's super obedient, too, by the way. Right? <laughs> so, like, this dude is, like, super obedient, right? What was I acting like? A cop, right? I was acting like a cop. But just because I acted like a cop doesn't mean I'm a cop. Just because you're in church doesn't mean you're a Christian. <laughs> Come on. We got, a pro- <laughs> we got a problem with some crowds. Come on, somebody. Listen to me. You get me? We got a big problem in 2018 with culture Christianity. Right? Culture Christianity has to be reminded of the message and the mission of Jesus. Jesus came for one purpose and one purpose only. And that was, right, and that was to save me from my mess. Come on, to give me an opportunity to eternity. Like, I, like, I don't know about you, right? But I was lost, disgusted. I was everything you can think about. But it, but, and he came to restore all my junk and all my mess, right? He came to restore that back so that I can have a relationship with God. And this whole idea of relationship is missed sometimes by people who think that they can come in and out of churches or church, right, and be religious about the way they go about their Christianity. And so there was two crowds here. Jesus is addressing these sinners, and he's addressing these prostitutes and these tax collectors, and he's telling them simply, listen, I'm going to I'm gonna share a story with you. And he goes into these parables, right? He starts to talk one through one. But here's the thing, friends, that every time we read a parable in the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, Who am I in this story? Who am I in this story, right? And he tells them the very first parable, and you guys know this, the parable of the lost sheep. And he starts to tell them about this man who left these 99 sheep, and he went seeking for that one sheep, right? He went pursuing that one sheep. He went looking for that one sheep. (laughs) And quite frankly... You got to know thing you, you got to know some things about sheep. Number 1, sheep are dumb. Sheep are blind and sheep are stubborn. And guess who we are? <laughs> That's not very encouraging, right? <laughs> Matter of fact, if you put a sheep in a sheep pen, it'll eat up all of the grass until there is no more grass. And then they'll start to go to the bathroom, and they'll eat up all the bathroom. Right? (laughs) That's why we need a Savior. Because if it ain't for my Savior, I'm going to indulge in sin. I'm going to indulge in all the wrong things. I'm going to be so full of myself that it's going to ruin me from the inside out. So I need to have a Savior in my life that's going to allow me, come on somebody, allow me to have a relationship, come on, and to have this intimacy with God. And so it's, 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 it, he's conveying basically to the crowds as he's looking to these crowds. He's looking at the sinners and he's saying, you need a Savior. You need someone who's going to look for you. Because let me tell you something, that the heart of the Father breaks for the lost. And God's heart is obsessed with finding the lost. God is obsessed 
with making sure that you and I are found, my friends. Listen to me right now. He, I didn't find God. He found me. I was too busy looking for myself. Come on. When God was loving me and obsessed in finding me. And he's telling this crowd. He's looking at them in their eyes. And he's saying, look, my friends, God loves you. They're accusing you, right? The other crowd is accusing you. The other crowd is, is making you to be the bad, right? When you're really the saved and the loved. And he's telling this crowd, by the way, not only did he find that sheep, but when he found that sheep, there was a celebration. There was a party. Come on, somebody. There was a party that, come on, that you were and I were found. And so God was always in the business of partying. Come on, somebody. Amen. Heaven's not going to be boring. It's going to be a big, big party. And we see how God continues to celebrate those that he continues to find. Not only that, but then he jumps over and he says, there's this woman who lost this coin. And he starts to talk to them about her pursuit to find that coin. And she's like flipping the house up and down and she's looking for this coin and she's moving furniture. Kind of like when you lost the money, right? You start looking for your money. Anybody ever here lost money before at the house? Right? And you like up all night. I can't find the money. The rent's due tomorrow. Right? Seriously. Right? When you call the bank and you're like, I don't know how these $500 left my account. Can you please start explaining this to me? <laughs> you ever been there? And all of a sudden, you're the, right, the BC version of you comes out. Like you will not rest until you get answers why that $500 is not in your bank account. Right? And so this woman is looking for this coin, and Jesus is looking at this crowd, and he's telling them about her pursuit to find the coin. Because although they were lost, they'd never lost their value. Even though they were lost, my friends, listen to me, but they never lost their value because that coin is valuable. And God is telling them, listen, even though you're lost, there's value in you. There's so much value in who you are. Right? I'm telling you. And so all of a sudden, these sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes, uh, they start crying maybe, right? They're crying and they're, the, the, the Holy Spirit is really speaking to them and and they're being convicted and they, they're, they're experiencing God's love like they've never experienced God's love. And they're being touched and, and they're being transformed. And something supernatural is beginning to happen in their lives. Anybody experienced that? When the, when the world said that you had no value, God says that you have value, right? When you and I were lost, right? When you and I were like doing what we were doing, you still had value. You had so much value. That God gave Jesus to the world because he, he was worth value to God. So much so that he gave him to us. So this woman is looking and finds this coin. And the Bible says that when she found the coin, she began to celebrate. She called all her friends, let's throw a party. Let's have a party because I found this coin. Matter of fact, probably the party cost more than the value of that coin. But the point was that she had celebrated that she had found what was vo most valuable to her. And here's the deal, that the coin was only valuable when it was in her hand. You're only valuable when you're in God's hand. Because then he can use you. He can use you. And so we, we friends, when you're thinking about the next game that you go to, just think about how much good you can do, right? In talking to that opposite, opposite uh, team fan, right? About a story like this. When I was in Cuba recently, um, it's really hard to do evangelism in Cuba. 
And so one of the ways that, that I thought you could do evangelism, obviously I'm not from the country, the culture, I don't experience a lot of the persecution that these people experience. But I said, they, there's a lot of, uh, peop the people travel a lot through buses. So I said, what about evangelizing people at the bus stop? What about reaching the people that are lost at the bus stop? Because if you're at the bus stop, you can begin to pray for people in ways that you probably wouldn't pray for them at church. Right? If you see somebody at the bus stop and the Holy Spirit reveals to you something that that person is going through, then you can walk up to that person and minister to that one. Right? So don't ever think that God can't use you to reach the lost that are sitting in the same row that you are. That's why there's faith night at the stadium. That's so powerful because fans can stay at the end of the game and hear from players who, who are walking with the Lord. Think about that. You have, you have, you have uh, players like, uh, matter of fact, I was telling Pastor Al, I was going to have uh, Manuel Margot here tonight. And so he was in. He's like, yeah, I'm in. But then he found out that the plane left af right after, immediately after today's game. Like they showered and then they took off. So I'm going to bring him back. I, I want to bring him because I want you guys to hear his story and, and what God is doing as, as a baseball player. Right? Yeah, he, he, he's an incredible, awesome man of God. But, I, but for a guy like him to stand in front of a crowd after the game and say, Jesus is my Lord. He saved me. I love him. Follow him. Come on, somebody, right? The influence that that guy carries. In reaching the people in the stands. So regardless of where you are at, we can reach people. Because God's heart breaks for the lost and those who have value. And so Jesus addresses this crowd. And then he turns over here. And he looks at the Pharisees, Sadducees, and religious leaders. And then he starts to tell them this parable of the lost son. You see, it's, the, it's about the lost son. One son was lost. And the other son was lost too. So it's two lost crowds. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Right? We all lost. Come on. We need Jesus. And he turns around and he looks at them and he says, hey, man, check this out. There was a man who had two sons. And one of them wanted his inheritance, demanded his inheritance. He wants to take what belongs to him and he wants to run off. And so he starts to tell them the story of this son who rebelled against the system, rebelled against his father, and squandered his life, spent the money, and you all know the story, ends up in the pig's pen, right? Because the reality is this, that sometimes we will learn from revelation or you, we will learn from rock bottom. Right? That's, that's the truth right there. Like, you're going to learn from one of the two. And so, and so this guy is, is hit the rock bottom, and then he realizes that he hit rock bottom. And he tells a story of, of, of how he, re, how he re, uh, bounced back from this place of rock bottom. How many rock bottoms we got up in here? Amen. Amen. You're looking at one right here. Trust me. I was rock bottom. Or what, the, uh, what Proverbs calls fool, right? <laughs> <laughs> fool, right? The only way fools learn is from tragedy. And sometimes those, those sometimes fools don't learn from tragedies. The Bible calls them mockers, right? It says don't correct them. A, a mocker is basically a fool on steroids. The only person that can help them is God. <laughs> you hear me? So he hit, hit rock bottom. So he bounced back from hitting rock bottom, and Scripture says that he went back home. He realized, like, my God, I'm in the... In, in an ugly situation, I got I to gotta bounce back from this. And he takes off back home. And scripture says that his dad saw him coming from afar. Wow, that's so powerful. Because before you were in here tonight worshiping God the way that you were worshiping God, God saw you from afar. Before you, come on, listen to me. Before you got into the men's home, women's home, God saw you from afar. Right? Before you came to VO, God saw you from afar. God 
dad saw him from afar. His dad saw him from afar. He was so happy to see his son come back. And he's t- talking to these Pharisees, and he's saying, he's telling them this story. But he's getting to a point. Come on, somebody, listen here. He's getting to the point. He's saying, listen, my friends, his brother's react, reaction to his brother coming home is the way that you're reacting to the people on this side of the crowd. Right? You're being judgmental. You're, you're right? Like, think about all these millennials, all kinds of millennials in here. When I walked into this church, I'm like, Pastor, oh, this is a millennial church. <laughs> Think about all the millennials and think about the way that we reach multimillionaire millennials. Like, how do you reach a multimillionaire millennials? It's hard to reach them without when they got no money. It's hard to reach broke millennials. Now, just think about millionaire millennials. <laughs> Come on, somebody. All right? When Pastor Al says, you know, we have ministry on 100 schools, over 3,500 kids come every single week to hear the gospel. Like, it's hard to get some of these kids to come. The only way that I can get kids to come is if their friends bring them. Right? And their friends are bringing them, and their friends are getting saved, and other kids are getting saved, and other kids are getting saved. And that's the way it is. But I remember in the early days when uh, kids came with, like, problems. You know what I'm saying? Hello. Hello. Little feminine guy, right? Like when kids started coming into the doors with like different problems, I started to realize what God was doing. But some kids started complaining. Like those kids belong in the LBG, LBGT club down the hall. I'm like, no, those kids belong here. <laughs> and I got some pushback from some, from some people. And then some churches said, no, nah, we don't want to be a part of this. I'm like, cool, we didn't need you anyways, right? <laughs> it's true. I'm just being honest tonight. You get me? And so sometimes we could really easily, this is why I love VO. Come on, somebody. Like, you are reaching, you are reaching so many people that other people haven't caught a vision to reach because you're seeing value. In the people that other people are overseeing. And this is because you have the heart of God. Not that other people don't. But you have a a special heart to reach people other people wouldn't reach. Right? And people tell me that. Like, dude, like, you're reaching all these kids. Like, how do you get them to do that? I don't. (laughs) This is all God, my friends. You get me? Like, I didn't sign up for this. I just ended up here somehow. I'm still on a journey, my friends. You get me? Like, we're just doing this. Like, we're just following Jesus. But we don't want to, we don't go on to get to a place where we start being critical and judgmental and, and start accusing and start pointing fingers and start telling this and that and, you know, become religious and become legalistic and, and so on and so forth. And this is exactly what Jesus was addressing to this crowd is this, this son right here, he's religious, he's legalistic, Right? He's worried about a young goat when his dad's got a fattened calf. He just hasn't discovered it. He just hasn't discovered it. Like this guy, this guy has no relationship with his father. You can see it right here in scripture. In every single one of his complaints in these sentences, you can, you can tell he had no relationship with his father. He didn't know his father's benefits. Come on, somebody. At least the other one was smart enough to say, Dad, in that culture, if you ask for your inheritance before you were dead, it's like you're saying, Dad, I want you to die. Right? Like the other guy offended the father and said, give me what belongs to me. In other words, die, let me take because, right? We don't get our inheritance until someone's dead. But yet the guy who was alive, who lived with his father, and and who was faithful, and he was there, he was hardworking. He's like, Dad, he broke the list, right, rolled over, and like, I did everything right. And you don't know how to take care of me? Lord, I've served you. Lord, I've been faithful. Lord, I've tithed. Lord, I've this, and you don't know how to take care of me? Come on, somebody, listen to me. 
I've learned to trust God in the hardest moments of my life because I'll never understand him if I question him. You hear me? When your brother is sitting, laying, I'm sorry, laying literally half a mile from this church on his back with two bullets in his back with no life, you don't have time to question God. All you can do is trust him. You understand what I mean? This guy had no relationship. And that's how religious people are. They have no relationship. They have just religion. And religion's going to choke you, but relationship's going to feed you. Right? <laughs> and so we, this, this, basically Jesus is breaking this whole thing down, and he's looking at him, and he's saying, guys, like, hold up. I came to die for you, to love you back to the Father, to restore the relationship back. Like, I want to be in this personal, intimate relationship with you every day. Every day I want to walk with you. I want to love you. I want to caress you. I want to hug you. I want to show you. And these sinners are probably bawling. They're on the floor. And then, and then these religious leaders are probably angry, right? Because the, the Bible says that the son was angry. And religious people could be very angry because they don't see what they want sometimes. Or like, it doesn't look this way or like... Like, are you serious, dude? Like, right? My friend says, you want revival? He goes, when revival starts showing up at your church with purple hair, piercing, and tattoos, we'll see how bad you want revival. <laughs> right? And so if it doesn't look the way that we're used to it looking, then you got to start questioning yourself because God is, just wants to love people. Jesus was just try showing them that he wants to love them. Jesus was just showing them that my father's heart breaks for the lost because they're valuable. And he wants to restore them. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. But I want you, I, I want to, I want to end with this. I want to just challenge you today. To really look deep down in your heart. And as I and as I see your church and I see your and I know your pastor and and just the incredible vision of Victory Outreach around the world. You guys are doing and you've heard this, I don't need to tell you this. You're doing phenomenal things all over the world. And for me to be a, a part of this small moment, it's huge. But as I think about 100 schools in this city, there's 280 schools, high schools, middle schools. I work in a district, Sweetwater Union High School District. It's uh, the largest secondary district in America. Over 40,000 kids in the district. 11 high schools, 11 middle schools. And the Lord's allowed us to walk into every single one of those schools every week and share the gospel. But there are hundreds of thousands of kids who need to hear that Jesus loves them, that he cares for them. Amen. I started at one school, the Sweetwater High School, down the street from here. And I ended up as a chaplain for the San Diego Padres. And who knows what's next. Right? Like every one of those guys, seriously, every one of those guys on the team is 20, 22, 23. I mean, these are, these, this is like my youth group. <laughs> when I walk in there, it's like I, I'm doing youth. Yesterday, we were having a Bible study, and we're talking about James chapter 3. And so we, we basically look at books in the Bible, and we read through them, and we just have a Bible study. And it's so powerful when you see some of these players opening their hearts and sharing what these scriptures mean to them. They're people just like you and I. They're people. And a lot of these kids, they're away from their families. They don't have regular church services. They're always on the road. They're always 
doing something in baseball, 162 games, it's a very tiring season. And baseball chapel is really the only hope that they have to hear the gospel. But you and I have the opportunity every day to bring the gospel. Especially in this culture Christianity world that we live in, in 2018. Where we need to remind people of the message and the mission of Jesus. And that's exactly what God, what Jesus was doing with these two crowds. He was talking about the message and he was talking about the mission. The message to the sinners and the mission to the religious leaders. So we need to, we need, I, I want to challenge you, especially all the young people in the gang. Like you guys are powerful. You, <laughs> man, I'm telling you right now, you have a network around the world. And, and I know that you guys are maximizing it and using it. But in this city, sky's the limit. The doors are open. I could, I, I'm telling you. You guys are going to do so much in this city. The future has just begun. And I really believe that with all my heart. Because you have some great pastors and leaders in this church. And they're going to send you all over the world. But they're going to send you all over the streets. As they're already doing. And get ready. Because mi casa, su casa. Amen. You want access to all these schools? You have access to all these schools. Go in there. Make this happen. I can't do it by myself. I can't do this. You hear me? Come on, let's give God a praise. Jesus, we thank you. God, we bless you today. God, we believe that you are here. Would you close your eyes with me? Just lift up your hands. God, I just thank you. I thank you for this powerful church, this mighty church, this incredible church, and the vision that is here.